Morning, everyone. I'm Anthony. I think most of you know me. Most of you haven't talked to me, though. Come and talk to me. I'd love to talk to you. I'm the youth pastor, along with my wife, Alyssa. Um, just want to welcome you all to church this morning. A couple of announcements. We've got a coffee hour after service, and next week we'll be doing a full lunch provided and stewarded by uh, my wife and I and the youth group. So it's a little youth fundraiser. Feel free to come by that, and you'll get an update on the Cambodian church ministry as well as our youth ministry. We'd love to see you there. Thank you all for being here this morning.
of worship, our gifts of offerings, and our Amen. gifts of love to you now as we continue forward in this hour of, of recognizing that you are our God and how grateful we are for you. We ask that in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Hello.
worship last night. It was a mixed service uh, and it was really uh, outpouring the spirit. It was very uplifting. Um, Amen. And so we're pretty dragged out actually. <laughs> we're kind of a little loopy. <coughs> no. You can just play. We're fine. We're good. This one's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
like this, but. <laughs> It's so nice having. Oh. One with God, the Lord knows Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You had a plan from the beginning. Took on flesh, you came in love. My sin was great, the cross was clear. Gift of mercy from above. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. God is a good God, and uh, I'm so glad that God continues to provide to us, but not just provide to us, but provides through us, and that's what I figured out when you give, and uh, growing up in India, speaking the language of Tamil, which sounds like camel with a T. There is a proverb um, that my dad would always remind me of giving even when you don't have much. 
and I'm not going to say it in Tamil, but it goes something like, the well that you take from produces more sweet water. The well that gives produces more is what it is. God has given to us everything in our life, and we always seem to say it are at our time of need, Maybe God has forgotten us. Maybe we don't know what is happening. Why am I having so little? Why am I having not more than enough? Why am I having provisions in my life that is hand-to-mouth kind of business, you know? Whatever I put on my plate, once I'm done, it's done. Whatever um, pay that I get, it disappears as soon as it touches my bank account. But God still continues to provide. And I started to learn, even as a teenager, that I got my joy out of giving. And as I kept giving, I found that I received more. God continued to provide more. And I'm not saying this just because we want to increase our, our budget I'm not saying this because our church needs more money. I'm not saying this because our God needs more money. Our God is the provider of everything. He gave the concept that you need money. You and I need money. With all these things said, I want to encourage you, whatever you may be in your life, give to God, not just financially, but through your life, through your time. People always complain about, I don't have enough time. Start giving your tithe to God in time. Start your day with God. Spend time with God and you'll see that things will be different. And right now in this service, we're going to give financially. And so we want to ask that you bring your tithes and your offerings because through this tithes and offering, we're going to be blessing so many around Portland and around the world. In Jesus' name. Okay? Dear God, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, and we ask that you come here, Holy Spirit, and be among us, be in us, be with us, speak to us. At this time, I pray that these offerings, the financial gifts that we bring back to you, Lord, be blessed be increased, be multiplied. I pray that the hands that provide be blessed. The works of our hands, the work that we do, Father, everything that we are will be blessed in Jesus' name. And I pray that these gifts and offerings, these tithe, will be used for your glory. Amen.
y'all doing? <laughs> Good to see you again. All right. Uh, where's Trudy? Trudy out there? There you are. Hey, Trudy. <laughs> I just have to say something. <laughs> so Trudy and I have been in bands together before, and I think I know what happened now. You were in the wrong key, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I have done that so many times, and I just want to say I'm so glad you did that because I feel better about myself now. Amen? Let's give Trudy a round of applause. She just got back from a mission trip. We're glad she's here. And I want to tell you folks, before we get into the Word of God today, um, I believe that God is at work. Amen? I'll tell you why I believe that God is at work, because I'm worn out. Amen? I am tired today. Um, and uh, I'm so tired I forgot to dismiss the kids and, and uh, J13 youth. They're tired too, and I'll tell you why. Um, on Friday, uh, they had a youth event. Uh, uh, Pastor Alyssa and Anthony uh, took, uh, took the students from our church and also from some other churches down to uh, Bullwinkles, uh, which sounds like fun. I think we should all go there after church, in fact, right? Um, and they had a great time. Everything went really great. Um, Pastor Sam helped them out too, and, and Corey Hughes from up at camp. So that was really cool. Um, but also, last night was, as I think Mark mentioned a moment ago, it was our uh, 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 bilingual worship jam, PDX Bilingual Worship Night, we're calling them now. And we were there, my goodness, I don't even know how long we were there, but uh, we had an awesome time. Trudy, Mark, and I were part of the band with Edith and uh, Santiago. 
um, and some others that maybe you recognize, and it was an amazing time. There was just, uh, it was, the, the place was just full of God's Spirit and just people worshiping. It was amazing. We had at least one young, young man came to faith in Christ. Praise God. That was awesome. And, um, and it was just a time of worship. It wasn't like we were preaching a sermon or anything. It's just somebody uh, needed to connect with Jesus, and that's what happened. It was amazing. A wonderful time of fellowship with other churches across cultural bounds, uh, churches from our Spanish-speaking community here in Portland. It was so awesome. So I just want to encourage you all, if you catch wind that one of those is coming up, and mark your calendars, because on July 29th we're going to have another one. What's the date? July 29th. Watch for it, because I want you all to be there. It's going to be at Cedar Hills Baptist Church, which is not far from here. Um, It's on the west side of Portland. It's going to be really awesome. But anyway, a couple other things that are going on that we should be excited about. Trudy um, was part of a mission team that just got back from Puerto Rico. They were doing some amazing things. Um, Talk with her about it to learn more. Um, We are preparing for a youth mission trip that will go to Rainbow Acres, which is an American Baptist ministry in Arizona that works with adults with uh, developmental disabilities. It's pretty amazing what they do. That's coming up. And next Sunday, uh, you'll get a chance to learn more about that. So uh, God is really at work. There's some exciting things going on. And it is daylight savings time, right? I woke up this morning. I can't believe I woke up this morning. First of all, I praise God every morning that I wake up. I hope you do too. Amen? You ought to because every day is a gift. But I do not like this business of getting one less hour. Every day is supposed to have 24 hours. Amen? Yeah. We got to write to somebody, I guess. But anyway, um, I'm glad to be here, and uh, let's let's get into the Word together, shall we? We are in John chapter 19. Uh, It is a difficult passage of Scripture, as you will recall. Um, Or if you're new to us today and you've read that part of the Scripture, you'll know that already. Um, And uh, we're just going to jump right into it with John 19, verse 31. You're welcome to read along in a copy of God's Word that hopefully you have out there in the uh, seats, or if you brought one, or if it's on your phone, wherever it is. I'm going to read it to you in the English Standard Version. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, For that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. Verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear And at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Let's pray. Dear God, we want to thank you so much today that we have another day, that you have given us another day to live in. And all joking aside about the shortness of this day, we are grateful to be here and we are grateful that we are entering into the spring season. Lord, we are so glad uh, that uh, we are going to be having longer days and uh, the sun will be out more and more. But God, we are most of all grateful for the fact not only that you died for us, but that you rose again on the third day. As that song reminds us, Jesus Christ, you are our living hope. We are so grateful for that today. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we look to the cross, as we reflect on the blood that was shed for us, that we would not be scandalized by the blood that would, in the sense that we would not want to talk about it, that we would avoid it, anything like that, but rather that when we reflect on your blood that was shed, we would reflect on the love that was shown, because that's what it's all about. Speak to us, Lord, through your word as we reflect on it together. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So as I mentioned and as I just read, obviously we're in John chapter 19. We're reflecting on the crucifixion of Jesus. And I want you to know that I have been in settings before in my life where people seem to have been afraid, even in certain Christian contexts, they've been afraid to talk about this part of the life of Christ. They seem to want, avoid, want to avoid talking about the blood of Jesus. Perhaps they consider it too gory, too painful, too difficult, too violent. Many Protestant Christians seem to struggle with the blood of Jesus. I'm not saying all, but I'm saying many. They struggle with the idea of the blood of Jesus, the crucifix, etc. Some will tell you it's because they want to focus on the risen Christ. I resonate with that, of course. But I think that when we don't spend time thinking about the suffering that our Lord went through, we're missing something. And as much as I don't agree with certain things uh, within the Roman Catholic Church, one thing I do appreciate about them is that they're not afraid to represent the suffering of Christ in art, a powerful reminder of what he has done for us. Last night, as I mentioned, we had a special worship night at Grace Baptist Church. Many different uh, congregations were involved, and it was a really special time, um, and in part, it was special, it was important, it was poignant, because the focus was on the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what we were reading scriptures along those lines. Remember last week we talked about the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross? That's what we talked about last night, what those final words of Jesus were as he was hanging from the cross. There was a song that one of our Spanish-speaking churches sung. I don't know the name of it. I had never heard it before, but it really spoke to my heart. The words were powerful because they talked about how as the nails were being nailed in. As that was happening, Jesus was thinking about us. Amen? The words also talked about as he was being whipped, he was thinking about us. And there was something about those words, singing those words, remembering what he's done that was deeply impactful to me. To be honest, it saddens me greatly when people, especially Christian people, seem reluctant to talk about the suffering that Jesus went through, which brings us, of course, to our big idea today, which is that to understand the blood of Jesus is to understand the love of Jesus. Amen? Say that again. To understand the blood of Jesus is to understand the love of Jesus. Last time we focused on those final words of Christ from the cross as he was hanging there. Today our passage describes for us what happened immediately after Jesus died. And for the next several minutes, I would like to talk about three important points that emerge from this passage. First of all, number one, the death of Jesus was required. The death of Jesus was required. Not only was it required in order to make possible our salvation, but it was required by the Jewish law and the way of doing things. You see, it was Friday. The Sabbath was upon them. Not only that, but with it being Passover, it was a very special holy day. Thus, the body of Jesus and of the other two men crucified alongside him couldn't be left hanging on their respective crosses. So the death of Jesus, as of the other two men, was required in that sense. In, in, in words that were ancient, even in the day of Jesus' death, Deuteronomy 21 verse 22 enriched the profound meaning of what happened on that important day, saying this, And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, or in this case, on a cross made out of a tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land and the Lord, that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. You see, something had to be done to ensure that these three people were dead. 
and then removed from the crosses before the sun went down and the Sabbath began. Otherwise, the land, which was such an important concept, would be considered defiled. Now, we all know, I think, that crucifixion was a particularly cruel and terrible form of both torture and execution, in which the victim could survive for many hours or even days, so long as they could use their legs to boost themselves up and suck in that air. But if the legs were broken, you could no longer push up, and therefore death would be imminent. The Romans, who were particularly efficient at taking care of business, they knew all of this. And so they invented a practice known as fragium, in which the lower leg bones would be smashed to hasten death when the victim could no longer breathe, coupled with a loss of blood and shock. However, the second important thing to point out is that Number two, the death of Jesus was authenticated. The death of Jesus was authenticated. At that point in the day, the two thieves crucified on either side of Jesus, they were found to still be breathing. Curi Phrygium took care of that minor inconvenience for the Romans, but Jesus was found to already be dead. Thus, it was unnecessary to break his legs. You might remember from last time, he had already said, it is, what? Finished. And then he breathed his last, and then he died. It took Jesus only about six hours to die, when it could have taken days for someone else to die. Why? Well, remember what they put him through before he even got to the cross. They had scourged him with a whip. They had beaten him within an inch of his life. So as it says, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Various theories have been offered over the centuries over what this was about. Some have said that it may have had to do with his pericardium filling with blood and serum. Others have seen it as more of a supernatural occurrence symbolizing the cleansing flow that washes away our sins. But I think the most likely reason for what happened is also the most gruesome, that the soldier's spear went through both the stomach and the heart of Christ, causing the flow of both water and blood. Whatever the case may be, the point was that he was clearly dead. Being run through like that would have seemed to it, though fully God, amen? Jesus was also fully man. He was a real human being who died a real death. The death of Jesus was authenticated. You might run into somebody someday who says, well, Jesus wasn't really a human being. He was like a ghost or something weird like that. I've heard people say things like that. There have been heresies throughout the centuries that have said things like that. You'll run into people who may say, well, he didn't really die at all. Nonsense to both. He died. It was gruesome. It was terrible. Don't miss the point of John 19. The death of Jesus was authenticated. Finally, the third thing to point out immediately after the death of Jesus is that number three, the testimony of John was asserted. What's the gospel that we're reading? The gospel of John. His testimony is very important for what we're studying. Remember who was there in person as all of this was happening. Not only the soldiers, including the one that pierced Jesus in the side, not only the unnamed crowds, but according to verse 25, if you look up, if you have your Bible there, you'll see that also there were five individuals in particular, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, her sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and, quote, the disciple whom he loved, a.k.a. John. In the midst of his agony, before dying, you may remember that Jesus had asked this John, this good friend, to take care of his mother after his death, to which John agreed from that hour, taking her into his own home. 
So these five people had a front row seat to the dreadful events of Good Friday. Most notably, the very person who wrote the very words that we are studying in the Gospel of John. The one who, by the way, in chapter 20, verse 31, made explicitly clear his very purpose in writing the whole thing, saying, these are written so that you may believe. Everybody say, believe. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. It's not by doing right. It's not by cleaning up your act. It's not by wishing someone well or sending a greeting card. No, it is by believing, amen, that you may have life in his name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. By the time John would have written his gospel, which would have been toward the end of the first century A.D., all sorts of different belief systems would have cropped up, each with different perspectives on Jesus. There were those who denied the incarnation of Christ, insisting that he had only been a spirit rather than a real person. There were those also who denied that he had really died. But John, who had been there himself, who had witnessed all the grisly details, could take a stand against any false ideologies, certifying not only that Jesus was a flesh and blood human being, but that this human being had most certainly died the most cruel death imaginable at the time. For John also saw in the events of that day the fulfillment of at least two prophecies, and they're mentioned here. Verse 36, For these things took place, he wrote, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Speaking of the Passover lamb, remember it was Passover. Exodus 12, 46 had said, it shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh of the Passover lamb outside the house, and you shall not, what? Break any of its bones. And Numbers 9, verse 12 had said, They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any of its bones. According to all the statute for the Passover, they shall keep it. And who was Jesus if not the ultimate Passover lamb? Remember how John the Baptist had referred to him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Old Testament prophet had looked forward to this event when in Zechariah 12, verse 10, he had penned the words that God had given to him hundreds of years before, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. It would not be difficult to imagine the four women there at the foot of the cross along with John to be mourning Jesus as they looked on the one whom they loved who had just been pierced by the spear of a Roman soldier. These along with so many other Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah had met their fulfillment in Jesus through his life on earth, his incarnation, his his work, but especially the work of that day, the work of redemption at the cross. It was the sort of thing that, as they say, you can't unsee. Have you ever been there? Have you ever seen something or witnessed something and you said, I cannot unsee that. I cannot unhear that. That experience, unfortunately, is emblazoned in my memory until the end of time. You see, they could not unsee the events of that day. They would have left an indelible mark in the hearts and minds of those eyewitnesses. And in the days, weeks, and years to follow, these things would embolden them to take a stand for what they knew, what they saw, even when faced with the harshest persecution. This, I believe, by the way, is one of the strongest proofs for the veracity, the truth of the gospel accounts regarding not only the death but also the resurrection of Jesus. But that, 
would be another sermon for another time. But for now, let's allow the words of John to speak for themselves in verse 35. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. The point is this that John once more is emphasizing the only requirement for salvation, belief in Jesus and in Him alone. Remember, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. It's happening right here in John 19. That whoever, what? Believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. The purpose of the book of John is that you might believe. That's the purpose of John's witness, which was asserted here in chapter 19. One of my favorite hymns, <clears throat> one of my favorite old songs of the Christian faith is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Anybody else like that one? I love that song. I love it when it's played with an organ. I love it when it's played with a, with a worship band and drums. I don't care how you play it. I love that song. When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, written by Isaac Watts in 1707. Can you believe that? Anybody remember that far back? In a few moments, when we sing it together, I want to invite you to really reflect on the words. That's what I want you to do today. I want you to reflect on the words of this song, especially given the passage of Scripture that we are studying today. One verse of the hymn hits me particularly hard, just like that song last night at the worship night hit me really hard. The song about the nails, remember? The song about the whips and all that. There's a line from When I Survey the Wondrous Cross that really impacts me, and here's what it says. And you'll sing it in a minute. I hope you'll join us in singing. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love, Flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? There's one key word. There's one key word that is missing from this particular verse of the hymn. What do you think I'm talking about? There's one key word that is missing from this particular verse. Well, that word is replaced by two other concepts. Concepts of sorrow and the concept of love. What is the missing word? The missing word is blood. Amen? The missing word is blood. After all, what else could have been flowing down from the head of one who had been pierced with a crown of thorns? What else could have been flowing down from his nail-scarred hands and feet. No wonder Watts replaced the word blood with the word love. Because after all, to understand the blood of Jesus is to understand the love of Jesus. What do you see? What do you see when you survey the wondrous cross? What do you see? In the blood, Isaac Watts saw sorrow and love. Last night, as I have said several times, sorry, it's on my mind, um, at our PDX Bilingual Worship Night, um, which, uh, you know, there, there was something, there was just a, an amazing, like I said earlier, just a sense of God's presence, God's spirit. We've been doing these events for about seven years now. And um, last night, those who gathered there, as the song says, we were engaged in surveying the wondrous cross. We focused on those seven words of Jesus from the cross, interweaving those famous scriptures with passionate songs of worship. And, and you know, there's a lot of talk these days. There's a lot of talk these days about people not getting along. There's a lot of talk these days about uh, diversity. There's a lot of talk these days about equity. A lot of conversation about those topics. And that talk is important. We need to talk about these things. 
But if you want to see the truest importance of diversity and equity firsthand, you need to join us someday for a PDX worship night. Looking around the sanctuary last night, you could see diversity. People of various races, languages, generations, and whose families had come from various countries in the Western Hemisphere. I met a family from Cuba. They were here just one month. But looking around that same sanctuary, as we were singing about those nails, as we were singing about the cross, as we were singing about the love of God, looking around that room, you could also see equity, or at least people who are on equal footing before God. As they stood together, despite their differences, at the foot of the cross. My brother in Christ, Pastor Primo Tame of Iglesia Vision Nueva, was compelled at the end of the service to read the words of Christ found in John 17, verse 20, when he prayed to the Father about us, saying, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, when Pastor Primo surveyed the wondrous cross, he saw the diversity of God's people that had been washed in the blood of Jesus, who were on equal footing before God because of what Christ did on the cross. That is the undeniable power of the blood of Jesus. That is why we must never shy away from talking about the blood of Christ. Speaking of our suffering Savior, another Old Testament prophet had looked forward to the price that he would pay on our behalf when he said, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what language you speak, what part of town you live in, or any of that stuff. I don't care. We are on equal footing before God because of the cross. My friends, what do you see when you survey the wondrous cross? Do you believe in the one who died there? Do you believe in the one who died there today? If not, may I invite you (laughs) during our closing song as you survey the wondrous cross, to consider putting your faith in the one who laid it all on the line for you on that day. It's something you can do in your heart, just between you and God, or if you want to talk with somebody, you can come up and we would love to talk with you, we'd love to pray with you. What do you see when you survey the wondrous cross? My prayer for you as we close today is that you would see beyond the tragedy to the peace Isaiah speaks of, to the healing he says that comes through those wounds, and most importantly, that you would see even beyond the blood into the love that caused it to be shed for you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we today come before you in awe Lord, as we in our hearts and in our minds survey the wondrous cross. Lord, it is this symbol that stands in the front of our sanctuary, proudly displayed. We could so easily take it for granted and say, well, isn't that a beautiful decoration? And Lord, it is, but it is so much more. It is an emblem of suffering. It is an emblem of shame. It is an emblem of your agony. But most importantly of all, it is an emblem of your love. God, I pray that each and every single person who is here today or listening online, that they would go from this conversation no longer if they were before concerned or uncomfortable talking about the blood of Jesus. 
For to understand the blood of Jesus is to understand the love of Jesus. Lord, may we be in awe of what you have done for us. May we never be ashamed of the gospel. May we never want to downplay it. But may we, like John, be bold in our witness. Recognizing what it cost for you to offer us eternal life. God, for any here today who need that eternal life, uh, who, who do not know if they have it, Lord, any here today who need to heed the call of John who wrote this gospel to believe, to trust in the one who died for them and rose again. Lord, I pray that you would move in their hearts, that you would help them to just say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, that you died for me and rose again. Forgive me my sins. Help me to live for you. Thank you for eternal life that is on the basis of belief. Dear God, for all of us, all of us, Lord, those who have believed in you even long, long ago, I pray that as we survey the wondrous cross, we would be filled with wonder. We would be filled with awe. Lord, our hearts would just be overfilled with a sense of love in your presence. God, you are so good. We thank you for this moment. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So I do invite you to stand. And we are going to sing this song. And Iris will lead us, I believe. Um, yep, there she is. <laughs> but um, as we stand and as we sing this song, I really don't want this to be like, uh, you know, oh, it's the end of the service. We need to sing a song, have the benediction, get out of here and go grab some lunch. I really want you to think about what this song is saying. Amen? I want it to be in your heart. I want you to look it up on whatever mechanism you use to listen to music. You know, on your phone, get a CD. I don't care. Listen to this song. Reflect on it because it's what it's all about. Let's sing it together, shall we?
Now receive the blessings. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our ways unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another and towards all men, even as we do towards you. To the end, he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now be blessed. God bless you.